accountants and brokers. This is a special presentation in the humanities. Major funding was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Sidney Porter was convicted of embezzlement of bank funds and sentenced to five years in the Ohio Penitentiary. But Porter was not a criminal, even though his loans from the bank were in fact a crime. Porter was a dreamer of dreams, a man who worked at many jobs but lived to write. He worked in the prison infirmary as a pharmacist, and it was here that he wrote some of his best short stories. He signed them O. Henry. But Porter not only cared for the physical needs of the inmates, he knew that the souls of these men needed care as well. Men whom the world had forgotten, Porter remembered. Try and get some sleep, Micah. I saw him take out Jack. Did? I'm afraid so. Doc could do nothing. He tried, I guess. Don't make him take me back, okay? Doc thinks I'm faking. Now you stay here, Mike. You ain't the doc, Bill. I don't believe nobody's sick less than he be dead. Let me see what I can do. Micah, where's Pete? They took him when he was gone. Ready to go back to work now? <laughs> um. <Got> over. <laughs> He's ready to go back to work. We better clean him off, huh? <laughs> <laughs> What are you talking about? It's a bucket ocean. And this wet air is a great carrier. So maybe you got it now. Jesus! Get him out of here.
12.30 a.m. Pete Puchowski hosed with freezing water during questioning by guards. Condition fair. Patient Dick Bates. Bright's disease. Condition serious. May not make it through the night. Doctor will examine on one o'clock rounds. If you knew where I really was, Margaret. My dear daughter, Margaret, it's been so long since I've heard from you. I'm anxious to know if you're well and happy in Pittsburgh. I'm writing a Christmas story for you. I hope you like it. Please write when you get this. I'm well. I miss you. Much love, Papa. Porter, bring me a bottle of morphine. Coming. Come here. Easy. <clears throat> I was hurting bad. I ain't making it, am I, Doc? Oh, rest easy, Bates. Your brain will go before your kidneys. There. That'll keep it till morning. The warden was asking me today, how you're getting along here. You know your medicine, Porter. I like that in a man. Your father did well to teach you the pharmacy trade. I thank you. And my father thanks you. Beats me how a man like you could end up here. I was wondering the same thing about you. I'll be at home. Keep me advised about Bates here. Feel my toes. That's good. Not my legs either. They're still there. So how's the story doing? Did it sell? They liked it, but they uh, they sent it back. Ah. Maybe some other magazine will do the story. Oh, they should. It was a good story. That's the main thing. Hey, what do you think these fancy magazines will do when they find out that in buying stories from a convict? That might be a story in itself. Hey, you see stories in every kind of place. I guess it's in the blood. You're writing one now, huh? What's got me going is a story about a safe. Like your safe? Well, you done heard my story enough times. As I recollect, you cracked it in ten minutes. Five. I cracked it in five minutes. I thought you heard it. I forget bits of it. You call yourself a writer. You can't even remember. Well, there was all these papers stuck in a safe. No one could get at them, no how. And the warden, he says, Bates, my good man. He calls me his good man, he does. 
<laughs> Bites, I'll see to it that you get a full pardon. You cracked that safe for us. Five minutes it was. My fingers were inside those tumblers. I felt them fall. Like, like apples from a tree. And that safe door, it swung out like the gates of heaven. And I thought, was in prison where he'd been for almost a year. One day, a guard came into the prison workshop where Jimmy was assiduously stitching uppers. Valentine. Hey, Valentine. Yeah. You're walking upstairs. Huh? Hey. Now, Valentine. Thank you. I hadn't even planned on cutting my hair. You'll be back, Valentine. You'll be back. A man who cracks safes cracks them again and again. Me? I've never cracked a safe in my life. And how did you get sent up on that Springfield job? I've never been in Springfield. This was the Bible, Valentine. This was the Holy Bible. Now, if you crack this instead of a safe, you could end up a decent man. Like you. All right, fix him up with some clothes. Try and make him look a little respectable. Clean him up and get him out of here by seven. You know, Valentine, if people like you abided by the law, there would be no need for prisons. I shall remember your thoughts, sir. April 12, 1899, Jimmy Valentine was released from the Ohio Penitentiary. With five dollars in his pocket, a five-cent cigar, and a new suit of clothes, he set off to make up for lost time. So 
the house, my boy. Sorry we couldn't spring you any soon, but the governor's no easy touch. You went to jail to save your neck. I promise I'll be out in three months. I spent ten. The governor took his time, Jimmy. Ten months, Harry? How was I to know Ben Price would testify at the trial? He's the best man Pinkerton's got. You're the best man I've got. Got my key? When you're all settled in, maybe we two can do some discussing about some small jobs I've got lined up. Jobs? Harry, the only job I've got in mind is selling biscuits. The name's Tommy Jones. Amalgamated short snap biscuits and crackers. You ever gonna have any free time, Mr. Jones? Why don't you ask? Matter of fact, I will. Nights, mostly. Any suggestions? Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy's was the finest set of safe-cracking tools in the East. Each piece fit together with perfect precision. With his unique talent and his prized set of tools, Jimmy could crack any safe in the country. getting a start on a story about safes well you know enough about them I have an excellent teacher <coughs> so what's it about it's about a fella named Valentine a safe cracker they don't say Would you be interested in hearing the tale, Dick? Oh, maybe. I just uh, check your facts, you know. Well, it seems this Mr. Valentine had done time for a job around Springfield. Pretty town. Of course, he said he'd never been there. Of course. That's how it always goes. Uh-huh. Well, it didn't take him long to get started. Banks in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Virginia, all of them felt the Jimmy Valentine touch. This attracted the attention of the Pinkertons, and Jimmy felt it prudent to move further south. So it was that Jimmy Valentine and his suitcase took the mail hack to Elmore, a little town five miles off the railroad down in the blackjack country of Arkansas. Here she comes. Whoa. Hold on. Whoa. I 
just step there. How's the ride in, Jim? Big good time today. Give us a hand, will you, Sam? Help you with your bag, sir. No thanks, son. It's too heavy. Awesome, on down. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for the help, Sam. Don't mention it. I will. Thank you, sir. Jimmy went to the Planters Hotel and engaged the room overlooking the bank. He told the clerk he had come to Elmore to look for a location to go into business. Jimmy believed in planning and needed an excuse to stay in town. It could be weeks before he was ready to make his move. Yes, I'd like to open an account. Certainly, sir. Shall we say uh, 10 or $20? No, let's make it 300 Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Uh, Spencer. Ralph D. Spencer. Uh, Binsley, sir. Nice to meet you, Binsley. <laughs> ah, Mrs. White. Nice to see you. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. What can we do for you this afternoon? I'd like to post $10 in the account. Yes, ma'am. How's the family? Much better, thanks. Now that James is over here, Oh, I am happy to hear that, Mr. Okay, White. Can I help you? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you, sir. Good day. Finally start to clear the north 40. Good day, Mr. Miller. Hope it all goes very well. This is Elmore. Uh-huh. Gee, thanks. What's your name? Tommy. Do you live around here? Across the street. Got any more dimes? <laughs> Hello, Annabelle. Good afternoon. Hey, Tommy. Isn't that Miss Polly Simpson? No, that's Annabelle Adams. Owns this bank. Owns this whole town, I reckon. for the bank were complete. There was nothing left but to do the deed. But for the first time in his life, Jimmy waited for reasons not even he could explain. 
Seen Annabelle Adams? Not today. No? No. Keep an eye out for her, okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Tommy, you see her? Yes, sir. She just went into the pharmacy. Thank you. if you'd be so kind as to marry me. Not right away, of course. These things take time. What? Please, don't answer right away. I realize it's much too soon. Perhaps at dinner tonight. I'll call for you at six. Oh, by the way, my name is Spencer. Ralph D. Spencer. Uh, is six too late? Then six it is. Dick. 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 Yeah. I'm still with you, Bill. Nice story. Dick. There's more. There's lots more. I mean, what about the detective? Who? Ben Price. Yeah, I knew a Price once. Seems he did work for Pinkerton's. Keeps them from showing it. You scared, Bill. Most of the time. Except when I write, then... Then I feel like I got the world by the horns. So tell me about this... This prize, fella. The detective. You playing him sharp? Like a razor.
I count ten banks in ten weeks. I didn't know Pinkertons could count. Richmond, Fredericksburg, Woodbridge. Different places, different safes. It's got to be Valentine. How do you figure? Jimmy Valentine has a signature. Three holes, four inches apart, like a triangle. You get me the Springfield report, and I'll show you. Get the report yourself. I don't suppose you have any information on the um, McCandle twin bolt lock? <laughs> no, but you can bet your soul Valentine does. Say, how much bounty you figure to collect on him? Is weight in gold? I will receive my normal fee. Sure. <laughs> Look, do me a favor. Mr. Price, go inside and get your reports, and then get out of my town. Agreed? Agreed. Pinkertons. <laughs> Pure silk, Jimmy. Pure silk. But when I get you this time, it'll be for good. Yeah, yeah, get up there. Get. Ben Price knew Jimmy's habits. Long jumps, quick getaways, no confederates, and a taste for good society. But no one moves without leaving a trail, not even Jimmy. And for five long months, Price tracked Jimmy Valentine from town to town until he, too, came to Elmore. Yeah, ha, yeah! Good luck to you, mister. Help you with your bag, sir. No, thank you. Something on your mind, boy? I ain't never seen a hat like that. Called a fedora. Mm. Got a dime? I do. You know most folks in this town? Yes, sir. I know the dogs, too. Some cats. Gee, thanks. I'm looking for an old friend of mine. Mr. Spencer, could you please bring in a size nine in the new brown shoes? Be right there. That's a dollar thirty-five, Mrs. Appleby. Size nine, Miss Adams? Thank you, Mr. Spencer. I'll be with you shortly, Mrs. Schneider. Take your time, Mr. Spencer. That's right. Thanks very much. Goodbye for now. So how's school going? Emily. <laughs> you don't like it. Education's very important. World changing as it is. Do you know the railroad's coming through soon? Doctor <laughs> says the shoe business is doing very well. It'll do better if the railroad survives. You doubt it, sir? Mr. Gray, I'm a businessman. I doubt everything. <laughs> Vector, I'd say you got yourself a fine future son-in-law here. <laughs> <laughs> Any man who can turn a small store into a shoe emporium in just five months. Ah, uh, four to be exact. But I didn't do it alone. Four months. By heaven, just think what you two could do in four years. I think you'll find that the Great Southern Railroad has the same outlook. Mm. Here, here. Yes, sir. Yeah. Victor, if you'll excuse us. Why, certainly, my dear. I'm sure the railroad needs more gentlemanly discussion. Indeed, madame. But we shall suffer in your absence. But you will survive. Miss Adams, the Great Southern Railroad always survives. <laughs> Gray, you made a wise choice in keeping your payroll in Mr. Adams' bank. The finest vault in the state, sir. That's a brand new Scott Safe Model 10. 
Not a burglar alive that can touch it, let alone come near your money. <laughs> so that wasn't the way it was up north, was it, Mr. Gray? Doc. <laughs> we uh, had a small payroll three years ago stolen from a northern office. But the criminal was apprehended? Yeah, I should hope. And he was shot dead trying to escape. By heaven, you will never suffer such consequences here. We're glad we're doing business with you, Mr. Adams. And with Elmore, sir. We believe that this town is going to triple in size when the railroad comes through, don't we, Ralph? What are the chances it'll make it here by early spring? I can guarantee you early spring. That is, if uh, certain senators perform as they're expected. Uh, you mean uh, if certain rights of way can be secured? This is a growing nation, Mr. Adams. And if some citizens feel their land can stand in the way of that growth, then the steel wheels of progress will roll right over them. You do have a way with words, Mr. Gray. <laughs> That's a dollar ninety, Mrs. Brady. Oh, the shoes are lovely. They look perfect, Mrs. Brady. Well, thank you, Mr. Spencer. <laughs> I just got this from your father's bank, and now I'm handing it right back again. <laughs> All in the family, Mrs. Brady. Oh, I suppose so. One day you'll face your own line of growing little feet. That's a distinct possibility. <laughs> now let's see. These should fit you perfectly. Thank you, dear. Ah, uh -huh, an adventurer's foot. Perhaps. See you, Captain. Ah, get up! solid bolts, Mr. Gray, and all of them shot home by one simple turn of the wrist. <laughs> and then it's airtight, watertight, and burglar-proof. And watch this. The gentlest push. <laughs> now they call that counterbalance, and I call it astounding. Very well made, Mr. Adams. Plus a time lock which is foolproof. All you have to do is you set it, close it up, and you're in business. How does it open? Well, until that little clock there says that it does, it doesn't. Amazing. Your money, the railroad's money, couldn't be more safe, Mr. Gray. I like that, Mr. Adams. I like that very much. <sighs> From the look of your trade, <laughs> you should be thinking about expanding next door. Well, the store next door is vacant. That's why I talked to Papa about giving us a, I mean you, a loan. You did? Well, a girl these days can't leave everything to the men folk. Papa said he'd think about it. He did? That's great. <laughs> he figures a loan to someone like you is a good investment in Elmore's future. In our future, too. I never thought it would happen. Me, you mean? I've been waiting a long time, Mr. Ralph D. Spencer. Mrs. Spencer. Hush, Ralph. It's bad luck to call me that before we're married. <laughs> I suppose I could wait another two minutes. Oh, I can't. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Mrs. Spencer. And I love you, Mr. Spencer.
make you a gift of my tools. There's plenty of fellas in Illinois that could use them. You see, I quit the business for good. Got a nice store, I'm making an honest living. I'm gonna marry the finest girl on earth. It's the only life, Harry. The straight one. Your old friend, Jimmy Valentine. a couple of days. I still wish I could come. No, it wouldn't be proper. Who cares about proper? Mm. I love you. I'm just going in to say goodbye to your father. I've got it. Ralph, meet your newest sales representative of Spencer Shoe Emporium. Next thing you'll be wanting <laughs> is the vote. And why not? Ralph, what's in here? Go Rick? No, 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 just some metal things that need returning. I thought I'd save express charges. Ralph, you are handsome, kind, and sweet. And what Daddy likes the most... Economical. <laughs> this is it. Now it's this. No, no, it isn't. It's this. Well, who are these two pretty ladies you got with you? <laughs> Oh, curly top and carrot top. Well, two of the prettiest granddaughters I ever did see. Can you keep an eye on this? Oh, I think I can handle them, yes. <laughs> Daddy, you need anything from Columbus? Ralph's going there on business. Hey, here, you two. Off you go, you two rascals. And don't go tipping over any inkwells. <laughs> you were uh, planning on you lying? Hey, Ralph. Well, in a way, yes, sir, I am. You first. What's inside? Monsters. Are not. Our two, Grandpa keeps them inside. The monsters will get you. to stand back.
it's all laid out neat on the table. All he had to do Ten minutes, Dick. That was all it took. She would have died. He knew that. He had to do it. He would have done the same thing. As you two were. You were a lot alike. Porter? I'm over here. pharmacist you should have called me people die in here every day it's nothing new don't get smart with me i'm responsible for reporting all prison deaths he died of bright's disease that's clear enough he died when he was nine years old is for the better. At least he died thinking he was going to get that part. They never were going to give him a pardon, were they? He was a three-time loser, Bill. The governor would rather pardon a murderer than give Dick Bates another chance on the outside. Dispose of the body, will you? Wouldn't you know that'd be the way life handled old Jimmy Valentine? Brought him right up to the end of the rainbow. And then it gave him rain. Right at the last. Two of them, face to face. Hello, Ben. Got around to it at last, have you? I guess you must be mistaken, Mr. Spencer. I don't believe we've ever met. That dead man just saved your bank, I venture to say. Wouldn't you, Mr. Adams? Is that any way to treat your wife?
1902, William Sidney Porter was released from the Ohio Penitentiary. For the rest of his life, he wrote stories about people who touched him deeply. And he continued to sign those stories, O. Henry. Tomorrow at 8, travel to the frontiers of northwest China and meet the famous Kazakh horsemen, unique people who are struggling to maintain their cultural heritage within China's rapidly changing society. Don't miss Nova tomorrow at 8. Now, stay tuned for a complete update on all the day's top news with the McNeil Lehrer News Hour, next here on 13.